Welcome to May's YA Snapshot. Today we are going to be reading Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber. This title is kind of like a companion to her other series, the Carvel series, um, and it will be having its sequel release this September, The Ballad of Never After. If you are a fan of her first novel or like other books like The Night Circus and stuff like that, this is a title you sure want to check out. Today we will be reading the prologue and a little bit of the first chapter. Let's go ahead and jump on in. Warnings and Signs The bell hanging outside the curiosity shop knew the human was troubled from the way he moved through the door. Bells have excellent hearing. But this little chime didn't need any particular skill to catch the crude jangle of the gaudy pocket watch chain at this young man's hip, or the rough scrape of his boots as he attempted to swagger but only succeeded in scuffing the floor of Maximilian's curiosities, whimsies, and other oddities. This young man was going to ruin the girl that worked inside the shop. The bell tried to warn her. A full two seconds before the boy opened the door, the bell rang its clapper. Unlike most humans, this shop girl had grown up around oddities, and the bell had long suspected she was a curiosity as well, though it couldn't figure out exactly what sort. The girl knew that many objects were more than they appeared, and that bells possessed a sixth sense that humans lacked. Unfortunately, this girl, who believed in hope and fairy tales and love at first sight, often misinterpreted the bells' chimes. Today, the bell was fairly certain that she had heard its cautionary ring, but from the way her voice affected an excited edge as she spoke to the young man, it seemed as if the girl had taken the bell's early toll as a serendipitous sign instead of a warning. Part one, the tale of Evangeline Fox. The Whisper Gazette, Where Will the Broken Hearted Pray Now? by Cutlass Nightlinger. The door to the Prince of Hearts Church has disappeared. Painted the deep blood red of broken hearts, the iconic entry simply vanished from one of the temple's districts most visited churches, sometimes during the night, leaving behind an impenetrable marble wall. It's now impossible for anyone to enter the church. Evangeline shoved the two-week-old newsprint into the pocket of her flowered skirt. The door at the end of the decrepit alleyway was barely taller than she was, and hidden behind a rusty green metal grate, instead of covered in beautiful blood-red paint. But she would have bet her father's curiosity shop that this was the missing door. Nothing in the temple district was this unattractive. Every entry here was carved panels, decorative artifacts, glass awnings, and gilded keyholes. Her father had been a man of faith, but he used to say that the churches here were like vampires. They weren't meant for worship. They were designed to entice and entrap. But this door was different. This door was just a rough block of wood with a missing handle and chipped white paint. This door did not want to be found. Yet you couldn't hide what was truly from Evangeline. The jagged shape of it was unmistakable. One side was a sloping curve. The other was a serrated slash, forming one half of a broken heart, a symbol of the faded Prince of Hearts. Finally, if hope were a pair of wings, Evangeline's were stretching out behind her, eager to take flight again. After two weeks of searching the city of Valinda, she'd found it. When the gossip sheet in her pocket had first announced that the door from the Prince of Hearts Church has gone missing, few imagined it was magic. It was the scandal sheet's first article, and people said it was part of a hoax to sell subscriptions. Doors didn't simply disappear. But Evangeline believed that they could. The story hadn't felt like a gimmick to her. It had felt like a sign telling her where to search if she was going to save her heart and the boy that it belonged to. She might not have seen much evidence of magic outside of the oddities in her curiosity shop, but she had faith it existed. Her father, Maximilian, had always spoken of magic as if it were real, and her mother had been from the magnificent north, where there was no difference between fairy tales and histories. All stories are made of both truth and lies, she used to say, what matters is the way we believe them. And Evangeline had a gift when it came to believing in things that others considered myth, like the immortal fates. She opened the metal grate. The door itself didn't have a handle. 
forcing her to wedge her fingers into the tiny space between its jagged edge and the dirty stone wall. The door pitched her fingers, drawing a drop of blood, and she swore she heard a splintered voice say, Do you know what you're about to step into? Nothing but heartbreak will come from this. But Evangeline's heart was already broken, and she understood the risk she was taking. She knew the rules for visiting the faded churches. Always promise less than you can give, for fates will always take more. Do not make bargains with more than one fate, and above all, never fall in love with a fate. There were 16 immortal fates, and they were jealous and possessive beings. Before they vanished centuries ago, it was said that they ruled over part of the world with magic that was as malevolent as it was marvelous. They never broke a bargain, although they often hurt the people they helped. Yet, most people, even if they believed the fates were merely myth, became desperate enough to pray to them at some point. Evangeline had always been curious about their churches, but she'd known enough about the mercurial nature of fates and fated bargains to avoid seeking their places of worship. Until two weeks ago, when she'd become one of those desperate people, the stories had always cautioned about. Please, she whispered to the heart-shaped door, filling her voice with wild and battered hope that had led her here. I know you're a clever little thing, but you allowed me to find you. Let me in. She gave the wood a final tug, and this time the door opened. Evangeline Hart raced as she took her first step. During her search for the missing door, she'd read that the Prince of Hearts Church held a different aroma for everyone who visited. It was supposed to smell like a person's greatest heartbreak. But as Evangeline entered the cool cathedral, the air did not remind her of Luke. There were no hints of suede or vetiver. The dim mouth of the church was slightly sweet and metallic. Apples and blood. Goose flesh covered her arms. This was not reminiscent of the boy she loved. The account she'd read must have been wrong, but she didn't turn around. She knew fates weren't saints or saviors although she hoped that the Prince of Hearts was more feeling than the others. Her steps took her deeper inside the cathedral. Everything was shockingly white. White carpets, white candles, white prayer pews of white oak, white aspen, and flaky white birch. Evangeline passed row after row of mismatched white benches. They might have been handsome once, but now many had missing legs, while others had mutilated cushions or benches that had been broken in half. Broken, broken, broken. No wonder the door hadn't wanted her to enter. Perhaps this church wasn't sinister. It was sad. A rough rip shattered the church's silence. Evangeline spun around and choked back a gasp. Several rows behind her, in a shadowed corner, a young man appeared to be in mourning or performing some act of penance. Wild locks of golden hair hung across his face as his head bowed and his fingers tore at the sleeves of his burgundy top coat. Her heart felt a pang as she watched him. She was tempted to ask if he needed help, but he'd probably chosen the corner to go unnoticed, and she didn't have much time left. There were no clocks inside the church, but Evangeline swore she heard the tick of a second hand, working at erasing the precious minutes she had until Luke's wedding. She hurried down the nave to the asp, where the fractured bows of benches ceased and gleaming marble dyes rose before her. The platform was pristine, lit by a wall of beeswax candles and surrounded by four fluted columns guarding a larger-than-life statue of the Prater Prince of Hearts, faded Prince of Hearts. The back of her neck prickled. Evangeline knew what he was supposed to look like. Decks of Destiny, which used fate's images to tell fortunes, had recently become a popular item in her father's curiosity shop. The Prince of Hearts card represented unrequited love, and it always depicted the fate as tragically handsome, with vivid blue eyes crying tears that matched the blood forever staining the corner of the silky mouth. There were no bloody tears on this glowing statue, but its face did possess a ruthless kind of beauty, the sort Evangeline would have expected from a demigod that had the ability to kill with his kiss. The prince's marble lips were twisted into a perfect smirk that should have looked cold and hard and sharp but there was a hint of softness to his slightly lower, full lip. It pouted like a deadly invitation. According to the myths, the Prince of Hearts was not capable of love because his heart had stopped beating long ago. 
Only one person could make it work with him, his one true love. They said his kiss was fatal to all but her, his only weakness, as he'd sought her, he'd left a trail of corpses. Evangeline couldn't imagine a more tragic existence. If one fate were to have sympathy for her situation, it would be the Prince of Hearts. Her gaze found his elegant marble fingers clasping a dagger the size of her forearm. The blade pointed down towards a stone offering basin balanced on a burden, just above a low circle of dancing white flames. The words, blood for a prayer, were carved into its side. Evangeline took a deep breath. This is what she'd come here for. She pressed her finger to the tip of the blade. Sharp marble pierced her skin, and drop after drop of blood fell, sizzling and hissing, filling the air with more metal and sweet. A part of her hope this tip might conjure up some sort of magical display, that the statue would come to life, or the Prince of Hearts' voice would fill the church. But nothing moved save for the flames of, on the wall of candles. She couldn't even hear the anguished young man in the back of the church. It was just her and the statue. Dear Prince, she started haltingly. She never prayed to a fate, and she didn't want to get it wrong. I'm here because my parents are dead. Evangeline cringed. That was not how she was supposed to start. What I meant to say were, my parents have both passed away. I lost my mother a couple of years ago. Then I lost my father last season. Now I'm about to lose the boy I love. Luke Navarre. Her throat closed as she said the name and pictured his crooked smile. Maybe if he'd been plainer or poorer or crueler, none of this would have happened. We've been seeing each other in secret. I was supposed to be in mourning for my father. Then a little over two weeks ago, on the day that Luke and I were going to tell our families we were in love, my stepsister Marisol announced that she and Luke were getting married. Evangeline paused to close her eyes. This part still made her head spin. Quick engagements weren't uncommon. Marisol was pretty, and although she was reserved, she was also kind. So much kinder than Evangeline's stepmother, Agnes. But Evangeline had never seen Luke in the same room as Marisol. I know how this sounds, but Luke loves me. I believe he's been cursed. He hasn't spoken to me since the engagement was announced. He won't even see me. I don't know how she did it, but I'm certain this is all my stepmother's doing. Evangeline didn't actually have any proof that Agnes was a witch, and she cast a curse on Luke. But Evangeline was certain her stepmother had learned of Evangeline's relationship with Luke, and she'd wanted Luke and the title he'd someday inherit for her daughter instead. Agnes has resented me ever since my father died. I've tried talking to Marisol about Luke. Unlike my stepmother, I don't think Marisol would intentionally hurt me, but every time I try to open my mouth, the words won't come out, as if they're also cursed or I'm cursed. So I'm here begging for your help. The wedding is today and I need you to stop it. Evangeline opened her eyes. The lifeless statue hadn't changed. She knew statues didn't generally move, and she couldn't help but think that it should have done something, shifted or spoken or moved its marble eyes. Please, I know you understand heartbreak. Stop Luke from Maris marrying Marisol. Save my heart from breaking again. Now that was a pathetic speech. Two slow claps followed the indolent voice, which sounded just a few feet away. Evangeline spun around, all the blood draining from her face. She didn't expect to see him, the young man who'd been tearing his clothes in the back of the church. Although it was difficult to believe this was the same person, she had thought that boy might be in agony, but he must have ripped away his pain along with the sleeves of his jacket, which now hung in tatters over a striped black and white shirt that was only halfway tucked into his breeches. He sat on the dais steps lazily leaning against one of the pillars with his long, lean legs stretched out before him. His hair was golden and messy. His two bright blue eyes were bloodshot, and his mouth twitched at the corner as if he didn't enjoy much, but he found pleasure in the brief bit of pain he just inflicted upon him. He looked bored and rich and cruel. Would you like me to stand up and turn around? so that you can take in the rest of me, he taunted. The color instantly returned to Evangeline's cheeks. We're in a church. What does that have to do with anything? In one elegant move, the young man reached into the inner pockets of his ripped burgundy coat, pulled out a pure white apple, and took one bite. Dark red juice dripped from the fruit to his long, pale fingers, and then onto the pristine marble steps. 
Don't do that, Evangeline hadn't meant to yell. Although she wasn't shy with strangers, she generally avoided quarreling with them. But she couldn't seem to help it with this crass young man. You're being disrespectful. And you're praying to an immortal who kills every girl he kisses. You really think he deserves any reverence? The awful young man punctuated his words with another wide bite of his apple. She tried to ignore him. She really did. But it was like some terrible magic had taken hold of her. Rather than marching off, Evangeline imagined the stranger taking her lips instead of his snack and kissing her with his fruit-sweet mouth until she died in his arms. No, it couldn't be. You're staring again, he purred. Evangeline immediately looked away, turning back to the marble carving. Minutes ago, its lips alone had made her heart race, but now it seemed like an ordinary statue, lifeless compared to this vicious young man. Personally, I think I'm far more handsome. Suddenly, the young man stood right beside her. Butterflies fluttered to life inside Evangeline's stomach. Sacred ones, all frantic wings and two fast beats, warning her to get out of there, to run, to flee. But she couldn't look away. This close, he was undeniably attractive and taller than she'd realized. He gave her a real smile, revealing a pair of dimples that briefly made him look more angel than devil. But she imagined even angels would need to be aware of him. She could picture him flashing those deceptive dimples as he tricked an angel into losing its wings just so he could play with the feathers. It's you, she whispered. You're the Prince of Hearts. Want to find out more of what the Prince of Hearts has in store for Evangeline and see if she finds out how to get her love Luke back? Check out Stephanie Garber's once Upon a Broken Heart, and prepare for the sequel coming out this September. To find out more read-alikes, check out Lafayette Public Library and see what you can get your hands on this summer.